Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is our August Carnegie Lecture Series lecture. And today we'll be hosting Paul Hayden, the director of the Northeast Fields Office of Indian Landmarks. And he will be lecturing us today on the presence of Indian landmarks in Grant County and their work on historic preservation and restoration on historic architecture here in the region. Uh, they've done a lot of good work here with us with the History Center, the local uh, historic preservation uh, organization of SOS, Say Our Stories Marion, and a lot of other good work here in Grant County. So we're looking forward to hear what he has to say about Indiana landmarks and what they've done here in Grant County. Take it away, Paul. Thank you, Colin. Well, thank you folks today for coming out and spending some time with me in this cool air conditioned room as opposed to being outside, sweating your eyeballs out. It's gotten to be a very warm day today. My name is Paul Hayden, I work for Indiana Landmarks. I've been with the organization for 18 years. And prior to that, I did work for a group called South Bend Heritage Foundation for 12 years. And uh, my training is actually through the, a carpenter's apprenticeship in the uh, local union in South Bend. And uh, so it's always been a construction related background, but more specifically, the restoration of historic buildings. I got into that work very early on and I'm still at it today and thoroughly enjoy my job. So it's my pleasure to be with you and share with you the work that we've done here at Indiana Landmarks. Um, Indiana Landmarks is a nonprofit organization. We're based out of uh, Indianapolis, founded in 1960. We're today one of the oldest preservation groups or actually one of the largest. We have nine offices around the state of Indiana. And uh, we have the largest employee, a number of employees. Uh, we have 45 employees scattered around the state. So we're very active doing preservation here in Indiana. Sometimes it seems like we're Indiana's best kept secret because we work kind of behind the scenes, giving assistance to uh, local groups to do their work and providing expertise there. So we're very much in favor of, of giving uh, credit to the local preservation groups that we work with. Okay, again. I mentioned that we have offices all over uh, Indiana, and I'm out of the, the Wabash office you see up there. I, I actually cover a seven county region, all the way from Fort Wayne down to Grant County to the south and everything else in between. So we're very active all over the state and not just Indianapolis like we first started. Let's start at the beginning with Indiana Landmarks. This uh, photograph uh, is a, a very old opera house built 1870s downtown Indianapolis on this circle downtown. Uh, this photograph is probably from the teens or 20s, uh, but certainly a landmark property. And then around uh, late 50s, early 60s, let me get to the next slide. Uh, that building was torn down. This is the same location actually. And uh, it was replaced by a JC Penney's uh, department store. And uh, Indiana Landmarks was founded originally by Eli Lilly of the pharmaceutical company uh, back at that time, who had a real concern about what was happening in his hometown. A lot of old Indianapolis was falling, being torn down to be replaced with very questionable looking architecture. And he was concerned about that enough to start a, a nonprofit group called Indiana Landmarks. Um, this was probably mid to late 60s. This is the construction of Interstate 65. That's actually being redone again today. And this is our current office right here. And this 65 is up to about the, the second floor windows. But that was a massive, long uh, interstate. It was very wide, it was very long. And huge neighborhoods were, were just uh, decimated by the uh, destruction of, of their old houses and commercial buildings. This is uh, also a house in that same neighborhood that was being cleared out for that uh, Interstate 65. Okay, here's what, uh, kind of a nutshell of what it is we do. We revise communities, reconnect to heritage, save meaningful places. And I'll give you the, uh, some examples of each. Talking about revitalizing communities. One of our first projects uh, was started in the late 60s in what is now referred to as Lockerbie Square. That's a very desirable neighborhood in Indianapolis, sort of north and east of downtown. Modest houses for the most part. You can see this is just a simple 
uh, carpenter's uh, stick style house that in total disrepair, and this was common throughout the neighborhood, well, we decided to make this a, a model project. And so this is the same house that after we renovated it, uh, sold it to an owner. And all of the houses since then have been bought up, renovated, and make beautiful family homes, uh, walkable to all kinds of amenities. So it was an early success story. It was a good demonstration project to show you what preservation can do to turn around neighborhoods and downtowns. This is another interesting project. This was in Evansville. This one we completed about 10 years ago. And Evansville every year in the local newspaper did what they called the idea house. You'll see that right here. Um, and what they would do is they'd buy a lot out in suburbia, build a brand new house, do a, a, a showroom, a showcase furniture uh, project with it and then resell it. And we approached the local newspaper who was actually funding that to say, why don't we do something different this one year and let's just pick a rundown old house, restore it, and then furnish it and sell tickets and what have you. So this was the house that would, they was settled on. The surrounding houses were also in poor condition. There was one over here in bad shape. You kind of see one over there. And this house was actually on the city's demolition list when we decided to uh, renovated. So you can see the results of, of what it looks like finished. And I'm pleased to say other houses along that street have also been renovated as well. <clears throat> uh, reconnecting the heritage. Yeah. Uh, this is Lyle Station School. This is in Gibson County, Southern Indiana. And this is one of the oldest standing African-American schools here in Indiana that's still standing. Uh, in very poor condition. This was probably mid-1990s. Uh, it was in a uh, serious collapse when we got involved with it to try to stabilize the building. And uh, this is a, just a great old picture uh, taken right from the building back in the 20s. But uh, after having worked on it for five or six years on that, it, uh, it was it's beautifully renovated. And today it's a museum. It's a uh, conference center, it's uh, open for receptions, it's, it's a small museum, there's artifacts from this smaller community. So it's a gem in this really, really tiny, small town. And it's important to the people there in Lyle Station that this building has survived. And we were pleased to be uh, a partner in that. Meaningful places. Okay, so here is uh, one of our projects. And we get such a variety of different projects. This is actually Northern Indiana in Beverly Shores on Lake Michigan. This photo we've taken here is taken in Chicago at the World's Fair in 1933. This was called the Florida Tropical House. This is how the architect predicted houses of the future would look like. And uh, after the end of the, uh, the, the fair, five of those houses from that event were shipped across barge from Chicago into Indiana on Beverly Shores. But it had fallen into disrepair. The, the five houses were all uh, single family, privately owned when the uh, Park Service wanted to acquire those buildings. And they did, they bought them uh, from the current owners to have them restored. They felt like uh, it was important for those houses to, because of their history, to be restored. Here's uh, uh, when we started on that. Uh, oh gosh, that was late 90s, starting to get involved. And here's the same building today. <clears throat> the paint uh, was actually the, taken from the original paint colors. We are actually take some scrapings and color matched it. So uh, you wouldn't believe how many bottles of Pepto-Bismol we had in <laughs> color. But uh, the, the effect is it's really kind of great. Because you have a, on a really nice day, you have the green in the foreground. This is, you know, Literally, the water's behind it, the blue of the, of the lake and the sky. It just really pops out. So it was a, a great project. Um, out of the five, four of them are restored. They're open up uh, for visitors in October, one day a month, or one day a year, I'm sorry. And the fifth one is uh, still needing a benefactor. Uh, we did get a, a grant recently from National Trust to put towards stabilizing the fifth house. So that's the last one, and I'm sure it'll be beautiful as well when we get to that. Um, here locally, we work with the SOS group that you're probably familiar with, but
but we also have a lot of partners all over the state. And one of my favorites who I worked with when I was in Sopin, Indiana, was in New Carlisle, and uh, their group was called Historic New Carlisle, and they acquired this house. Uh, it was in near the downtown, it was on a tall embankment. Uh, uh, it was the uh, uh, service house, is what it was called, the little famous last name. And uh, the city had uh, put a demolition order against the property. They had erected a fence. Kids were getting into it. Uh, it was in serious disrepair. So we worked with the local historic New Carlisle to acquire it from the previous owner, but also to get funds, helped fundraise, and we gave them a loan to get it repaired. And so this is uh, the house uh, today, actually. And so a beautiful restoration. Uh, Historic New Carlisle, when they were finished with it, they actually used it uh, for a museum back here in the little kitchen wing, and they had some offices. And then this became a bed and breakfast. And they just sold this, um, I think, about two years ago to a new uh, family who's making it their private home. So a great project uh, by that group. So this is our happy group. Uh, you know, celebrating the completion of their, of their project. One of the largest projects to date is West Baden Springs Hotel. I don't know if anybody's been down there. Our involvement on that building goes back to the mid 1980s. Uh, it had been vacant for about 10 years. It was in serious disrepair. Uh, we got involved when there was a, a collapse that was experienced at the building. This is actually the outside wall that you see here. This is an interior wall. And this collapse went from here over to about six uh, hotel rooms over to that side. And uh, the that back of the building was in very, very poor condition. So uh, we acquired the building and we got a grant to buy it and to just stabilize it, put a new roof, rebuild the wall, and then we market it. And then a developer did buy from us ooh, in 99, I think, and then it reopened about two years later as a full-fledged hotel. So if you're ever in the area, it's worth going to see. Uh, this is just a, a view from behind. So beautiful project. It's one of the largest we've worked on to date. Uh, this is the interior when we first acquired it. As you can see, it's been vandalized and it's trash. It was pretty horrible condition. And then uh, same view after the restoration is over. Uh, at, at the time, this was built in 1905. This is one of the largest, at that time, unsupported domes in the country. You can see there's no columns coming down to support other than these, but not out here in the middle where it would keep it from collapsing. But it was a, an engineering marvel, the way that was put together. And it's held up pretty well to this day. Um, going to uh, also Indianapolis, this is our corporate office. This is the uh, first Methodist church here in downtown Indianapolis. Had not been a church for about 30 years, I think, when we had acquired it. We had outgrown our previous location. It was actually a, a large brick of tiny mansion, but it was still tight for all the employees that we had working there. So with the, uh, a grant, we were able to buy the building and then seek funding to uh, restore it. And this actually, from top to bottom, was a $20 million restoration, so it was significant. And like we do with most projects, uh, we start outside and we start from top down. Uh, the roof was shot, there was a lot of plaster damage inside, and so it's important to stabilize it, get things dried out. So you can see the this is the first order of the day. And then this was the, the completed building. So you can see the old church on the right side of the screen. These were actually Sunday school classes over here. This is mostly where our staff works is in this building. And then the sanctuary is used for all kinds of events, uh, concerts, wedding receptions, uh, uh, yeah, the art gallery space, um, all kinds of presentations, kind of like what we're doing here today, uh, we host in the old sanctuary. So it's, it was a, a great project. This is an interior view of the sanctuary, but you can see kind of some of the, the plaster is falling down, the stained glass windows are broken, the roof leaked, it was, it was in serious disrepair. And then after the restoration, this is what it looks like today. We're hosting one of our many events there. Okay, so what we've done is we've traveled all over Indiana. We talked about various things that we've done in other communities, but I also did want to focus on some of the work that we've done here in Grant County. 
Uh, our office, I've been in there now for eight years. Uh, we've had other staff members from Indiana Landmarks before I was here. And so this is just sort of a quickie overview of some of the things that we've been involved in to help preservation along to happen here in, in Marion and Grand County. One of the things I wanted to bring to your attention is our involvement for our 10 most endangered list. And um, the way that works is we want to bring attention. This is not to be negative towards the owner, but it's to bring attention to a worthwhile building that's going to be a struggle to, to restore and develop. And when I first started uh, in, let's see, 2016, this one was vacant, I think, for the following year, 2017, about that time. And so we put it on our 10 most endangered list to draw attention to what a wonderful old building it was and what it possibly could be. Uh, we actually listed it for two years. And um, if we don't find success in the first year, we'll list it for a second. Uh, first year, we'll do it a second year. So, uh, and as you well know, uh, a, a local architect did buy the building and did a marvelous restoration. I would also say he did a historic tax credit uh, that's important to note on really large projects like that. The start tax credits will get the developer back 20% of their investment, which is hugely successful. So that all that put together, and this uh, was restored and is a really an asset for your downtown today. Somewhat across the street is the old Firestone building. And I did want to uh, talk about our, our partnership on that. And this is owned by the local SOS group, uh, the Firestone building, I think built in 1937, give or take a year. And um, it was just still owned by Firestone up until about a year, a year and a half ago. And um, a lot of planning, I think, going around in the commercial district nearby, but yet here was this, you know, handsome looking older building standing there vacant. So we partnered with SOS and we gave them uh, two grants. Uh, one was a structural grant to inspect the building to make sure it was in okay condition. And then another grant that looked in depth at environmental conditions on the building. Now, as you might imagine, with this having been uh, an automotive use and a gas station, there would be environmental issues. So uh, they applied for uh, a grant through the state, which addressed all of those issues. And, and it now has a clean bill of health. But I mean, this is a, a current photograph. Oh, we took the plywood off. That's not current. But anyway, uh, that's what the building is, the location. The other one I would say uh, is not the same building. It's, it's a very similar model of a Firestone in LA. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of what it could look like with a little bit of a rehab. Also, I'll bring you attention to the uh, train depot here in South Washington Street. This building was built about 1893 and had been used uh, as a train depot until the late 1950s, where it became other various uses and then vacant around 2016, when the current owners, the Quilters Hall of Fame, bought it. Now, uh, our involvement uh, with the group is we did loan them the money to buy the building and, uh, and get it into their hands. Uh, they paid that back in full. And, uh, and afterwards, we recently gave them a, a grant. Uh, it's what we call our Ephraim grant, and that helped pay for uh, the front entry door, right here. And there's actually two doors our grant paid for one, and they paid for the other one. But it's a handsome building, and they're doing a terrific job on the restoration of this building, and they will be opening up there in the, in the near future for office space, classroom space, workshop space. Just a really great project for us to have partnered with them on that. Okay, also in the town of Marion is this church here. This is down on South Adams Street, 1501 South Adams. Uh, this was uh, for many years, it was the First Friends Church. Uh, and it was, I believe the congregation was there until the mid to late 1980s. And then it's gone through a number of different owners. And then for the last 10 years, it's been vacant. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough situation. It's probably one of the, the more difficult re restorations or saves that I've been involved in. It's also part of our, again, 10 most endangered list. Uh, it was listed last year. We really didn't get a whole lot going on it last year. Um, so we're relisting it this year for 23. 
And already we've successfully raised a hundred, let me think, $150,000 to stabilize this building. Now, what that caught, what that money will do is pretty much put on a roof over the entire church and the education wing to the back and replace some of the broken windows. Now, there is not a development plan beyond that, but we felt it was important for us to get involved and stabilize the building and safeguard it so that it'll be around a year, five years, 10 years from now to actually do something uh, with it. Now, it could be a church because obviously that's what it's built as, but we get involved in a lot of projects that are adaptive reuse. So we don't have to have a church there. This could be a, it could be office space. It could be classroom space. It could be apartments. It could be condos or whatever. Uh, whatever goes in uh, would have to be complementary to uh, the, the building. Uh, we also have a, a fairly good sized grant of our own money into this project. And with that grant, we stipulate what we call protective covenants. And what that means is, uh, even when we're no longer involved with this building, the protective covenants stay in, in perpetuity. And so the historic nature of the building uh, would have to be retained. And the owner is, is fine with that. And we'll probably also work on getting it listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And uh, with that, it would qualify for the historic tax credit that I mentioned at Ridley Tower. And uh, one last thing that's unique about this, of course, is, is it was designed by African-American architect Samuel Plato in 1914, I believe. 1914. What year was that? 1914, yes. 1914? Yes. Okay. 14. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 1914. Uh, this is one of his larger, largest standing buildings uh, here in Marion. It's, it's a very handsome Gothic re revival kind of a, a church design. Um, so again, uh, realistically, it needs a lot of work, but we're committed uh, for the long term to seeing this building saved and a new use put into it, whatever that may be. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Also, a Samuel Plato design is the former J. Wood Wilson House uh, here in Marion that is now the Hostess House. And just a beautiful, handsome, uh, classic revival home and really maintained well uh, to this day in its original condition, both inside and out. Uh, Landmark's actually just recently approved a Stanley Cox grant uh, for, to be spent towards some maintenance issues on this building. We're very glad to, uh, to do that. What's unique about the Stanley Cox grant fund is Stanley Cox was a longtime employee he was a chemist at Eli Lilly, African-American. And after he passed away, his family created this grant fund to be spent on uh, historic properties that have African-American histories attached to them. And so the group put an application uh, for some maintenance work that they want to do, and they gladly uh, approved that. So that monies would probably be set down in the very near future. Okay. Um, this one is the Davis Clinic. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with driving by this one, uh, north of town on Washington Street. Uh, this was also featured on our 10 Most Endangered list. And it was just the one year. Uh, built in 1942. No, I'm sorry, 52, 1952. And it was the original design was by um, Harry Weiss. Harry Weiss was out of Chicago, and it was a very important architect for the mid-century modern uh, era. And he originally built this clinic as a one-story design. I've seen the old photographs just from here now. And then um, there was enough demand for that that it was expanded to the second and third floor at a later date. Now we've been through it, and it has what we call a lot of architectural integrity. In other words, today it looks more or less like it did, you know, 60, 70 years ago. And uh, it's still privately owned. It was on the market for the last three years. I, I'm assuming it has not sold. Um, they were asking an enormous sum of money for it. But uh, eventually it will. They'll get tired of it sitting there and it will get sold. I think personally, it, it's also a good candidate for adaptive reuse. It could be you know, housing, it could be office space or a combination thereof. 
but uh, a very important building uh, for those who are fans of the uh, mid-century modern architectural style. It's just a uh, really good original condition by uh, Mr. Weiss. Uh, this one is also, uh, we believe to be a Samuel Plato design. We did not verify that for sure, but there's enough uh, of his hallmarks of design that we believe that to be the case. Um, and this was the Halderman house uh, when it was built and then it became the Stevenson's house only five years later. And the Stevenson's were there until the 1960s when the family passed away and became a rectory for St. Paul's. But I did want to point out, I added this picture to the far right and that is an interior stained glass windows with Halderman's initial age and that survived today. So I thought that was great. So anyway, a nice property, uh, an impressive house, uh, carriage house, uh, triple lot, surrounded by the brick wall and so forth. And uh, we loaned uh, SOS the dollars to acquire this property. Uh, and actually, uh, that's not totally accurate. Uh, we would lend them the money for the rehab the property. I, I should give credit to the previous owner, they donated to SOS. So there was no acquisition cost, which was great. So our money went towards repointing the, all the brickwork on the main house and then putting a brick, or I'm sorry, a roof on, on the main house as well. Uh, there was some really bad roof leaks on this, and there's some, a lot of uh, plaster damage and so forth. And then uh, during uh, SOS's ownership, they actually re-roofed the, uh, uh, the carriage house. And uh, then about a year and a half ago, they sold it to another private owner who's looking at doing um, possibly a restaurant there is what the talk is. And so that's being worked on. And uh, it's it's a great property. Again, uh, sometimes uh, these these projects take a long while, but having stabilized the building, it's it's no longer taking on water and so forth. So it'll be around forever and ever. And then again, because we have money into the property, it is a protected landmark. Okay, so that's it. That's an overview of uh, what we do, who we are, and what we're about. And that's my contact info. If you ever have a question on a historic property in your community, just give me a call and you can send me an email at the bottom. And also I would mention, I've got a stack of our magazines over there. Feel free to help yourself. And there is uh, a membership brochures, which uh, you're welcome to take as, as well. And so uh, we today we have 6,000 members to Indiana Landmarks. We're always looking to add to that. So please uh, take a, a brochure and a magazine and and let me know if you have any questions on, on your particular restoration projects. But uh, I would be glad to take any questions about our work around the state or here locally, if you have anything that you wanted to, to ask. Oh, back one in the back question. Paul, are you aware that when Tuesday's Indianapolis Star First Friends Church, there was an article just this week? No. However, I think what that was for, uh, we just announced our, our, our 10 most endangered list this week on Monday, and we're getting calls all over the state. It, it goes out to a lot of the major media sources around Indiana. I've actually gotten several calls out of um, Fort Wayne because I have a, a listing of a property, a National Harvester uh, Engineering Building in Fort Wayne. But it's good that people are, are seeing that. We, we love the fact that this, this 10 most endangered list accomplishes what we set out to do. And that's to bring uh, attention to these landmark properties that are, yes, are distressed. That's why they're on the list. But we're think, we think they're, they're, they're very worthwhile to, to be restored and find a new use. So I'm glad to hear that. Any other questions about what we do? Um, aside from becoming a member of Indiana Landmarks, what are some of the things that you would recommend for people who care about encouraging or supporting historic preservation in this area or in the spaces where they live? Oh, terrific. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, Indiana Landmarks, at times it seems like we're Indiana's best kept secret. And that's because we work in the background to support local people, local uh, nonprofits, uh, local individuals, et cetera, et cetera, and give them the resources. 
Uh, we do not have enough staff. We do not have enough funds to go out and save every old, cool old building that needs to be saved. So uh, we work with uh, local groups and usually it's, uh, I do do outreach to individuals, but a lot of what I do is other preservation nonprofits, SOS being the uh, local example, but also municipalities. We get a lot of calls from mayor's office, um, city council presidents or, or whatever to say, hey, you know, we're concerned about this building that's very beloved in our community, but it's, it's going to be torn down or there's a, a structure issue. What can we do? So that's part of what we see our role as, is, is a resource. We get those calls and say, hey, do you have a contractor? Anything, we get all kinds of calls for uh, plumbing, roofing, masonry repair, whatever. Um, what can I do? I'm here in my grandma's house and it's in an awful condition. How can I protect it? I want to sell it, but I don't want to turn it down. And that's where protective covenants would, would, would take place. So we see ourselves as a resource. Now, people will oftentimes confuse us as part of the local government or the statewide government. We're not that. And we don't dictate what you can and cannot do um, at that level, unless it's a building that we previously own. But um, we're here to give suggestions and ideas. Uh, we, we, we oftentimes talk about financing. And that's, as you might expect, is always the big issue is we, we see all of these wonderful historical buildings that need tender loving care, but it comes oftentimes down to resources. And so when people reach out to us, we can talk about uh, loan programs and grants that are available, not only by us, but others as well. The State Historic Preservation Office has a, a fairly large grant program that comes around once a year. So we can uh, key people in to what's available to them out there so that we don't lose another important building in the community. So, um, but uh, be involved and join you know, your local group or we are SOS group here is sort of a mini version of what we do statewide. And so they would certainly uh, appreciate your membership there. And uh, it, it, it makes a change. Uh, I've been here at this office now for seven years and worked exclusively with the group. And, They've done some amazing things in that short amount of time, but we're seeing that here and other places. So pleased to be a part of that. Any other questions you might have? Like one in the back row. Yeah, I'm just curious to know, um, do you ever get any calls for help in trying to restore significant old schools? Or is that something that's pretty much left up to the locals or the neighborhoods? We do get a fair amount. I'm actually dealing with the folks up in uh, North Manchester on the Thomas Marshall School. Um, the way we we provide education is very different today than it was 100 years ago. So we have everything in Indiana from one room schoolhouses to fairly large, bulky, two-story brick school buildings from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But a lot of those, by education standards, are obsolete. Uh, city corporate or school corporations will move out of them, they'll tear them down, or they'll just build new. So we do have more than our fair share of uh, vacant school buildings around the state. And I think more so than any building I can think of, schools are really a good candidate for adaptive reuse. And I can, I can think of 10 right off the top of my head that were retrofitted into loft apartments and or senior housing. Uh, one classroom, which is maybe maybe about this size, I don't know, uh, makes a perfect you know apartment, one bedroom, two bedroom apartment. And so uh, again, uh, you know, we provide that information as a resource to say, line up your historic tax credit, line up your grant, uh, line up your your grant for housing you know, seniors of of mo moderate income, and put all those pools of money, sometimes on the restoration of one big building, might have eight or 10 sources of financing. It's very complicated. And I'm not a finance person, but I'm glad there are other people who are. Um, getting that all put together to then um, do a retrofit of what would been a school is now something else. And um, apartments and residential seems to be an answer. Uh, based on that though, probably the, I will say the most, Difficult projects that we have to deal with our churches right now. And you just see the example up here. And, and there again, 
uh, times and cultures and people's lifestyle change. And so when I was a little kid and my parents and my grandkids or grandparents, you know, were growing up, everybody went to school and our church on Sunday, of course. And well, it's not a criticism, but we're, we're not as likely to do that today. So we're seeing huge, large churches that were built 100, 140 years ago for a very large, stable congregation that are now dwindling. Uh, 50, 100, 200 tops on, on a large, large church. And uh, we're trying to address that. It's uh, Indiana is unique. We have a program called Sacred Places. We've been involved with, I think, we're up to three churches here in uh, Marion. Is that, does that sound about right, Bill? And uh, actually, I was just over the first United Methodist a week ago to talk to them. But anyway, under that program, because churches are such a huge concern, is we're working with congregations to give them the, the tools and the information to help them stabilize <laughs> and also finding different ways to use their churches. The days of having 200 members supported financially only to be open for an hour or two on a Sunday doesn't get it anymore. The maintenance costs and the, the gas bill and everything else that goes with it is very difficult. So we're just talking about ways to possibly use your buildings that produces income. Um, if it is needing restoration, how will you go about doing that? What, what does proper restoration look like? Are you aware of what to do, what not to do? And so we'll you know, advise on that. So yeah, there are issues out there like old schools, big old churches, industrial buildings. It's, it's all part of our landscape. So Tom, you got a question? Yes. Um, on your section on Grant County, a bit focused on Marion a lot. Yeah. I was wondering, did, does any landmarks, has it had any um, interactions with historic preservation like Gas City or Fairmount and so on? I've done some one-on-one -on -one in both Gas City and Fairmount. Fairmount, I think I've uh, been down there a couple of times, uh, but less so. I've actually had um, uh, a contact in Upland that I've advised to on a couple of occasions. Um, so less there. Uh, typically, we do not uh, go to a community unless we get it for lack of a better way of putting it, an invitation. Right. Um, so uh, when we get those calls, we'll be glad to go out, look at the property, tell them, you know, if it's historic or worthy of restoration, and maybe how about it, how you would go about doing that, maybe where you would find some monies and so forth. Um, so less so, I, I think Marion, because it's such a, a large community, a much larger population, uh, a lot of my time here is uh, in, in Marion. Any other questions that you have for me today? Sue. Can you address the covenant that you have for some buildings? Sure. Uh, what, it, what it means. I think there's a lot of misinformation floating around about what, what that means to a, a homeowner. Okay. A building. Yeah, a building. Okay, good question. I, I really do think that needs emphasis because people, uh, you know, I oftentimes hear, well, I don't want anybody telling me what to do with my building. No, that's not what we're here for. But we do have a covenant program, and it's to protect the historic nature of the building. And gosh, all of these buildings that we were involved in, not all, but many of them. Okay, this one. Uh, this one, uh, this is the old depot, South Washington Street. We uh, loaned quilters uh, the money to buy that. We also gave them a grant to do some more type of work. So it has a cover. Uh, buildings that we give loans to, buildings that we ourselves own, we attach what's called an exterior covenant. Not inside, just exterior. So, you know, it's not the whole building. And what it, in a nutshell, what that means is, is that if we have a covenant attached, it is uh, our uh, goal to retain the historic appearance of the building. So for instance, in this example, you've got a, uh, a yellow glazed brick uh, depot structure. Uh, you've got a wooden porch here, a uh, uh, roof at the top. Uh, it's going to have to, with our covenants, we would have to make certain that this would uh, retain that appearance. And uh, what things we would not allow, for instance, just to use an example, with that being glazed yellow brick, we wouldn't want to see paint on that brick. Uh, if we're in the process of restoring the windows, we would not want to see those 
windows ripped out and new replacement windows, vinyl windows, things that were not uh, original to the time that was built. Those covenants do stay in perpetuity, so that's you know forever and ever and ever. And on most of our properties, and I, I think I did mention we have a thousand of these around the state, most of those are on residential homes. Um, some people, when we're selling one of our houses, when they, especially on residential, hear that there's a covenant, they will tell me, and I, I appreciate their, uh, their truthfulness, I won't want to buy that because I can't do what I want to do. And it's just like, well, thank you for being upfront with me about that, but that covenant is going to require that. And so, you know, if that's important to you, then you'll have to buy another house. And so uh, if we've invested our money into getting it turned around, getting it restored, this is now a community asset. I mean, when you drive down the street, it's such a handsome, restored looking building. Um, a lot of people have put time, money, and energy into getting it that way. It was in serious disrepair five, six years ago. So that's our intent. And so if you were to buy one of our houses and you uh, know there's a covenant, typically what I'll do is I'll spend some time on the phone and say, here's the things that we require you to do. Uh, here's what we're not concerned about. We don't get involved in maintenance. If there's a little peel paint, you can scrape and paint it. We don't too much get involved in the landscaping, go out and plant whatever flowers you want. It's the, you know, the small things like that uh, we typically don't worry too much about. But if on bigger things, uh, like you're going to replace the roof, uh, roof, I will just write up a report and uh, you have a current sh asphalt shingled roof, you want a new asphalt shingled roof, you'll get an approval from me in 24 hours. It's not that big of a deal. And again, as I as mentioned about 15 minutes ago, we want to be a resource. And so um, when we get homeowners who have never owned a historical a house, and it's even if it were restored, it's still going to need repairs five, 10, 20 years out. They really kind of appreciate the fact that they can call, ask that question, I'll come out, no cost, no fee for that, and just give them the best advice to maintain or to restore a covenant protected property. So uh, again, the majority of our properties sell if they like the building. I have had, I've had some, but very few that the buyer walks away because of the covenants. And, and again, I, I think that's, I appreciate the fact that they're, they're not comfortable uh, having that. So it worked out in the end anyway. So does that answer your question, Stuart? Did I need to end? I think, yeah, okay. Um, any other questions? We have time for about two more questions. Okay. We have time for two more questions. If not, we adjourn for punching cookies. <laughs> so, and anyway, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, help yourself to the magazines. Our uh, uh, brochures are up there. We help uh, th that as well. Uh, if you haven't gotten uh, something to write down on my phone number or email, you know, contact Colin. I'm sure he can connect us together. Yeah.